Hi there. Welcome to the Raven's Call. I'm Eric Ward Weaver Shervin, Gothi of the Ridgar folk here in East Texas. I'd like to welcome you to my show. Uh, obviously, if you've been on the channel at all, uh, this is a show where I ramble on about different heathen related subjects, different things that catch my, my mind, my eye, and uh, kind of light my mind on fire. And so today, I wanted to talk to you guys about something that I find very interesting and uh, very deeply meaningful. This one is probably going to be fairly divisive for some people because it does get off into the woo-woo side of things. That's my way of saying that it delves off into my personal UPG, which if you're not familiar with that is, it's unverifiable personal gnosis. Uh, these are the insights and personal experiences of individuals that can't be verified by archaeological digs or by source materials. These are things that exist within the mind and solely there. Well, mind, body, spirit, you know, in a person's experience. Uh, they're not part of the greater body of lore. So you're not going to be able to go to uh, the, the Eddas or some of the sagas and be able to find my particular view on things, but this is my particular view. Okay, Now, the subject at hand, I have seen a lot of people talk about this in times past, and uh, it's the subject that I want to talk about today is what's known as what I call the beast within. Okay, And um, you guys know what I'm talking about, at least some of you do. Uh, this is that animal that's inside us. Um, some of you, and I'm not going to talk about people you know, I'm going to talk about you yourselves. Some of you know deep down inside that there's a wolf inside, that there's a bear inside, uh, that there's a cat inside. Shout out to Brandon, you guys met him before. Um, I'm about to explain what that is and where that comes from. Uh, this is kind of a spin-off from my Soul Complex video, hence why the splash card mentions the Soul uh, Actually, I may redo the splash card. What you guys don't understand is I've shot this once already, did not like the way that it went. I rambled too far off of the important bits, and I cut the whole bloody thing, and this is take two. So I'm probably going to go back and redo that splash card and take it out. But this does branch off of my Soul Complex videos. If you haven't watched those, time out. Go back and watch, okay? You want to watch the spiritual side of things. Uh, you want to pay attention to a certain couple of areas. You will pick those up here in the intro. Uh, but if you don't have a grasp on how I see the soul complex, then what's about to follow is not really going to make a lot of sense. This is where the videos start to take a turn. This is where uh, a lot of the different elements of things that I see, my worldview, all come kind of spinning into a coalescence. Um, you will find out that each of the videos that I've done before has been setting a precedent, has been establishing context, some kind of groundwork that is necessary for my points in later videos to make sense, because otherwise uh, they would not. And so uh, this is one in particular that if you want to keep up with terminology, then follow along. I will add little splashes of text down here in the bottom to explain what I can, show you spelling on a few things. Um, I will tell you that I was not able to do this during the days of the soul video, and as such, I can't really go back and redo those um, because of where they are in the process of things. They're already up, they're already encoded, they're already out, you know, and I don't have this, I have some of the source material for those, uh, but it's not something that I just keep around because it adds up, stacks up gigs upon gigs of video after a while. So, but here's the deal, okay? We're gonna talk about the concept of totem animals. Uh, this is what has been talked about before in other videos. You will have seen, I think Arataga did a good one on totem animals. Uh, there are other videos out there on totem animals, um, I'm not a huge fan of the term totem animal. Um, it's not particularly heathen, and it doesn't really grasp it, okay? There is, you know, I get it. Everybody's like, oh, this is my spirit animal. This is my totem animal. You know, I take, I, I think that I'm a, uh, I think I'm a wolf because I'm awesome, because I'm this, and you know, listen, guys, I get it. It's cool. It sounds awesome. Everybody wants to be a berserker or an ulfednar. Um, Put those down here. Uh, Ulfednar were a particular branch of berserker, uh, berserker being the bear shirt. Uh, the Ulfednar, 
uh, those that donned the wolf pelts and were kind of uh, kind of a mercenary group uh, after a fashion. They were an elite warrior group uh, that that spun off. Anyway, uh, they are something that is tied to all of this in the same way that the beast within is tied to everything. And that's where I go, the beast within. And it's more than the beast within, it's the wild. Because there is a piece of the wild in all of us. Now, if you've looked at my soul complex videos, you will see that there are different aspects of the soul. You know, I separate, um, they all make one big us. But there's different parts, different aspects. And here's the deal. There are the parts that come from the natural world. There's the parts that come from the sacred world, uh, the spiritual side of things. Um, all of these coalesce into who we are now. We only ever exist in the here and now. This is us and this is the only time that we will ever be us. When we die, and you can go back and look at my most recent video on uh, heathen mound culture and uh, how I see the heathen afterlife and kind of see where I see about this. But in death, we dissipate. We break apart into our core pieces and we go back to the ecosystems from whence we draw the, drew these particular energies. So, and I talked some about the Fera soul in that video. I talked about the Fera soul in my soul complex videos. Now, I for one feel like, and if you look at my heathenry and science video, you will see that I feel like uh, these metaphysical energies, these spiritual energies mirror uh, what we know as Newtonian physics, etc., etc., uh, because it's just simply how the systems that the gods put into place work. So law of conservation of energy indicates that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. So spiritual energy is recycled. Uh, the physical makeup that is our bodies, the protons, neutrons, and electrons, all came from something before. Uh, they were grown from the natural world. The spiritual energies that make up our, our soul parts all come from different parts. You know, we borrow the Otr, which is that spark of divine madness from the gods. That is our their gift to us. That heightens us and turns us from uh, what we were as Vaitir spirits to who we are now as humans. Uh, it's that which lifts us above being simply Vaitir uh, to kind of a weird hybrid between Vaitir and godhood that is mankind. So um, I, I did this in the last video too. I rambled a little bit too much, so I'm going to try and kind of pull it back to point here. Um, what I'm talking about specifically is the Fera soul. Now, you will hear people say that I think I was at this in the past life, you know. Um, people talk about past life regressions, and of course, like I just said, all of the energies that we use in the soul are recycled energies. So yes, I completely believe people have past lives. I think you had a crap ton of past lives because I think you are a Frankensteinian monster of soul energies, physical pieces, and everything comes together to make you who you are now, and you are the sum of all of those energies that have come before. It's just as much a part of your Orlog as the deeds and actions of your ancestors. So that all feeds together to make who and what we are. And deep within that is the Fera. Okay, now let me go back. We're going to talk a little bit about the origin of mankind in, in heathenry. And we're going to talk about Odin, Honor, and Lodr, uh, the three gods who were walking along the beach. And they found sticks. And uh, they, they gave to these sticks the form and mind of mankind, breathed in life, gave them that divine spark that turned them into Osk and Emble, which um, Ash and Elm, uh, the first man and the first woman. Now, this is a very important part that Osk and Emble came from the trees. They came from sticks and were turned into man and woman. This is an important part to me, all right? This is something I clue into because this is the Fera soul. This is the Vetir soul. We were L'Anvetir who were turned into mankind. They took, they created the worlds and then they pulled an element of that world forward, gave it a dash of divine madness, 
and suddenly here we are. And so the fera soul is that tree soul. That's what it typically translates to, what, what it, it relates to. The way I think of it is that the fera soul, that tree soul, is the soul of the trees from which we came, of the vetir, of the land, of the wild. The fera soul is the pharaoh within. Now I've talked before about the concepts of, you know, the when we do ritual with the gods, we, we get in touch with our over. When we get when we do rituals with like the ancestors and whatnot, we pull from different parts of our soul. Um, when we do ritual with the Vaitir, it's just the Fera that we pull from because that's what we have in common. Now, the way this manifests in everyone is that we inherit this Fera soul, this feral soul. And it is seated in our soul complex. That is that base from which everything is molded and created, and this is us. And we carry that mark because we all come from the wild. We all come from the Vaitir. Um, I see the Ask and Embla story as a, the story itself occurring in sacred time, which would be almost instantaneous to the gods as they see, oh look, sticks, look, man and woman. Awesome. Ashkenemblech, here we go. Now, for us in Midgard, in the profane world, we perceive that slower. It's not fast like it is to the gods because the gods are so much grander than us, so much more that their concept of time is completely different to ours. Not to mention, I honestly think that sacred time versus profane time work differently. One is of the gods and one is a pale imitation thereof. And so profane time I do not see as functioning the same way. Uh, so what, what seems a second to the gods is eons to us in a lot of ways. So this is evolution. You know, what would, we would perceive the physical manifestation of the vase here in the world being crafted and shaped and given the tools by the gods over time as the evolutionary process that leads to humanity as we know it today. Um, the gods would see it as, oh look, mankind. Uh, we see it as a much longer process because we are here in this world. Um, you know, what would take you a split second is to, you know, if you look at like uh, Dr. Seuss and Horton, here's a who down at Ho Whoville uh, with all of these, anything that Horton does uh, would be <laughs> tremendously longer to the Who's down in Whoville because their reference point is so much smaller. That is us. Humanity is the Whovians to the gods, and uh, the gods are, their time frames are completely different to us. So we would see it as evolution. Back to point. In all of that, we come from the wild. The wild is in us. The wild is a part of our inheritance. It is something we can never be fully divested from. Now, the gods are gods of order. They give us the gift of rational thought, of creativity, of the ability to manipulate things to our benefit. But they, they gave that to a wild spirit, and that wild spirit is still there. And that wild spirit doesn't necessarily have a fixed form. Now, like I said before, uh, these energies are recycled. They come from the wild, and so they just keep getting churned back through. And so when we pull from the wild, we're going to pull a set of energies that may predominantly have been of one particular animal or one particular species, um, and that be the key of that, that spirit. Uh, it be the same kind of spirit that feeds the wolf, that feeds the bear, that feeds the tiger, uh, lions and tigers and bears, oh my, whatever. Um, when you take those elements and you plug them into us, then we're going to manifest a lot of the same characteristics that we associate with them because we ourselves are feeding from that same energy base, okay? The wild is there. The wild remains a piece of us, a crucial piece of us because we are forever animals. And so when you talk to someone and they talk about their totem animal, they talk about the beast within. They're very much, to me, and again, UPG alert, this whole freaking video is a UPG alert. Um, to me, that's the key. 
there really is an animal spirit within you. There genuinely is, because that is what you use to communicate with the the Vigtir world, the spirit side of the world, and uh, which is different than interacting with Helheim, uh, that spirit world, the Chthonic spirit world of the undead, is different from the spirit realm, um, which is closer to Lyosafine, uh in my eyes, uh, as far as that goes, you know, the, the world around us, the spirits, the fey folk, the huldra, the hidden folk, um, the nisse, the tomta, all of these exist, in, I'm not going to put all those in the bottom, I can't, can't keep up, um, all of these exist in that spirit realm, and we exist in a weird kind of in-between phase. Animals can pass back and forth between the two worlds fairly easily. If you want to get a primer on that, go back and look at my Vatir uh, Spirits video, and you will understand how I see the hierarchy of spirits. Mid-level spirits and higher-level spirits do not necessarily have a fixed physical form. I do not see that as being the case. Uh, I see them as being able to shift form and uh, take on different aspects. Um, you know, this is a bit of a, a, a pulling from an outside source, but it's a guy I think kind of gets my mentality on the situation. And some of you are familiar with the artwork of Brian Froud. Um, he is responsible for things like um, his fairy book, his goblin book. Um, he did a lot of the artwork for Jim Henson back in the days of uh, the Dark Crystal, Labyrinth, things like that. Uh, Henson pulled a lot from Froud's work. Now, Froud has a theory in his fairy book, which is, again, it's just kind of how he sees things, but this is genuinely his insight that he's putting into this book that is, you know, it's a fun little fictional book. But there's a piece of his own insight in here. And I, it's the weirdest places you find where people strike something true. And so in here, he says that fey folk take on different forms depending on who views them because they do not necessarily have a fixed corporeal form. Their image, their appearance is going to be influenced by the psychic energies projected upon them by the people viewing them. I see this as... Vatir, because I see the Fey folk of fairy tradition, of Celtic tradition, as being just another level of that, that mid level and upper levels of Vatir. That's just simply what they call them versus what we call them. I see the same thing happening here in North America with things like Sasquatch and uh, Chupacabra and some of the other uh, cryptozoic elements being manifestations of mid level Vatir in certain areas. I have met some of the higher level Vatir and mid level Vatir in the area, and they have their own kind of feel, their own aesthetic, but again, they all exist. They're, it's all just different like, subcultures within the spirit world. So, all of that means what I'm what I'm leading to with that little side tangent is that the fera part of our soul doesn't necessarily have a fixed form. It, it's a weird interaction between our own personality forms and our own uh, projections, as well as you know the shifting and impermanent nature of the wild energies in and of themselves. So. I don't feel like the Fera soul is necessarily fixed to one particular animal, uh, shape, or plant, or bug, or whatever it may be, because anything from the wild could be the Fera soul. Most of the time I find it to be animals that we identify with, uh, that we are drawn to, but sometimes it is. I've known folks that are definitely spiders, uh, or are, you know, scorpions, lizards, things like that. Um, that don't necessarily fit the more typical mammalian or aviarian um, view of the totem animal, the beast within. Um, I think a lot of people cannot actually read their fera and don't have a good picture of what their fera is. I think that the more disconnected we become from the wild and the more fixed we are in the codified world, in the, the, if anybody used to play Werewolf, uh, Werewolf the Apocalypse, the old White Wolf games, uh, they had a great breakdown of the wild versus the weaver, 
uh, the, the wild, organic, ever-shifting versus the weaver that locks everything into place that is the modern world, that is uh, logic, that is pattern, that is codification. That's a, that's a great metaphor for what I'm going at. Um, but we have that element of the wild in us, ever free, ever growing, that won't be caged. If we cage it, it diminishes. If we do not feed it, it diminishes, and we diminish ourselves. You see those memes that pop up and say that, you know, happiness is not a loaded block of people. It is not a, a you know, business building. It's not these things. Happiness is the wild. It's the calm and quietness of, uh, of the wilderness. You see the ones that say, you may not find any Wi-Fi here, but you'll find a better connection. And it's a picture of an, an empty forest. Uh, with a single person walking through. This is the fairer soul screaming to us in the modern world to come back and find the beast within. Find your connection. People can be trees, people can be plants. And to say that you are this, yes, you are. There's a piece of you that is that. It is not the totality of you, but it is a piece of your soul. It is a piece there, and everyone's got a piece of it. It manifests differently. But everyone has that spark of wild in them somewhere. The more we feed into the mundane world, the logical world, the rational world that we have created, thanks to the gifts of the gods, uh, the more we pull away from the fairer roots. And we cannot exist in this world without the feral connection. Um, we have to maintain balance. Again, everything comes back to balance in my books. Um, you know, and I, I know it's not even necessarily balance, it's proportions. It's because um, things don't yin and yang type balance in, in the world. Um, but elements have to be kept kind of in proportion with one another. They need to be kept, and they'll ebb and flow, give and take. And that is life. That is how things work. So you have the mind, the hammer. You've got these aspects of the soul complex that are the more codified rational um, elements of like the God's gift to us kind of thing. You've got the folk soul aspect that is tied to our ancestral pull. You've got the lich that is literally built from the dirt on which we stand. Uh, we are star stuff. That is true as can be because we are built from the same materials uh, that occurred when Ganunga Gap exploded with the fires from Mosprelheim and the ice from Niflheim and uh, gave us Midgard after Odin, Lili, and Ve, slew Ymir, and crafted this world for us, okay? All of this is what we are made of. All of it's what we're made of. This is the wild that we came from. The wild dates back to the fires of Mosprelheim. The form, the codification, the material dates back to the ice from Niflheim. So together they create the world that we have around us with the gift of, I'm yanking on my cable, sorry, with the gifts that the gods have given us, we wield these energies and we live our lives. So you will see people that are, you know, we talk about the totem animals, you talk about the Pharah soul within, you will see people that are wolves, that are pack oriented, pack dynamics. Um, some are alphas, some are betas, some just kind of fit in there in between, some are megas. You never know. Um, there's a certain stillness, yet predatory. Uh, those with predatory spirits tend to be kind of set aside from society, especially the wolf, because they're their own pack. Uh, they, they tend to in and get and distance from the rest of the world, um, but they are fierce. They're also uh, very protective. Of, of, of pack and tribe. Um, I have a dear friend of mine who was a tribe member back in the day who I named the Bear Heart because he has the noble soul of a bear as his fera. Uh, this I have no doubt of whatsoever. Um, if you know anything about bears, you know, they are equal parts just endearingly cute and beautiful creatures, uh, but in the same, as soon as things need to get real and the teeth and claws come out, they are the living embodiment of terror. You know, uh, even the great grizzly bear, if you see them just plodding along, they're almost comical 
in their endearingness. Um, you watch them scratch and look for food and things like that. They're just beasts doing what they do. They're, they're living souls, they're living a life. But when they turn and need to hunt or they need to defend, uh, there are few forces on the face of Midgar quite as terrifying. And this was this guy, you know, this guy was the most normal, endearing, lovable guy, uh, put you at peace to be in his presence. He was just great. He was a cool guy. Uh, is still a cool guy. He's just not part of the tribe anymore. Uh, went on to different ventures. Uh, doing good, so I'm real proud of him. But uh, he was the most endearing guy. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, when things needed to get real and the gloves needed to come off, he was the most terrifying, unstoppable force of nature you have ever seen. Uh, the guy's huge anyway. Uh, so not just size, but sheer force of will. This man was unstoppable. And so he was the bear. I know people that have had more of a warthog kind of, uh, or a boar element, more, more the boar than the warthog, the, the, the kind of Russian boar uh, that we see predominantly in North America. Anyway, um, I've seen those hardy individuals that are, you know, good at sustaining and that are good at, at finding and doing and don't mind getting their hands dirty and just keep plodding along doing what they do and they're dependable, uh, you know, stocky individuals. I know people like this. I know people who are more on the serpentine side of things that are less trustworthy, more uh, mercurial, uh, that are slithery and tend to worm their way into things and who, when they turn and bite, are venomous and vicious and quick to do so. Um, I know people that are from an aviary kind of side of things, the birds. I know a woman in particular who I would swear up and down left and right her fera soul is that of an owl, um, seeker of wisdom, uh, somewhat aside from society, definitely a creature of the night, much of a loner even though uh, she could be seen in social circles. And she never really quite connected. I, I also think she was Feyborn, but that was beside the point. <coughs> but she also had a, a, a deep predatory nature to her that uh, that always came through kind of in the background. Um, I know people who are, you, you've met him on the channel, the cat. Brandon, his fetish soul is very much the cat. And he embodies so much of those traits. And it's not that someone acts like the animal, you know, someone with a wolf soul is not going to walk around and howl at the moon and all of this stuff, unless they choose to. Uh, but they will embody some of those traits that we associate with the wolf, because they have the same spirit energy that makes up the wolf and that feral, that feral soul. And so I very much believe that, that, that these totem animals, for lack of a better term, exist. Matter of fact, I think they have to exist because they're a part of us. The system doesn't work unless it's still there. If we don't have that touch of the wild, then we don't continue on. Um, and as I said before, I don't know that it has a fixed form. You can have more than one because I know people that are uh, wolf-like in a lot of traits, but also raven-like um, in a lot of ways. Um, I know people that are kind of a mix between ferret and magpie. Believe it or not, it's kind of a weird thing, but I, I've seen them, I know them. Uh, I know people that are a weird mix of mammalian and fish. It doesn't matter because all the energies came from somewhere. It's just energy, and these energies fuel these animals the same as they fuel us. And the traits manifest in the animals one way, and they manifest in us a slightly different way, but they all come from the same source, and that is the wild. This is something I think can change because the soul within is is uh, it's mutable, it's it's shiftable. If you look at some of the stories, Seth Kona, or practitioners of Seth magic, um, some of the sorcerers that you see in the lore, in the sagas, are said to project their hammer um, and, and out into the world and it takes on a feral shape. I actually think that this is a mix in dealing with the fera soul as well. And it's actually elements of the fera soul bleeding through into the hammer, etc., etc., etc. Anyway, um, if you look at, and I said I'd come back to this, if you look at berserkers, uh, who are said to be these wild warriors who had uh, reckless abandon on the battlefield, who were just unstoppable, whom uh, fire could not burn and iron could not bite, uh, these men who would bear out the soul of the bear. 
and it would bring that fera soul up and the wild beast within unleash it upon the battlefield and i think there were a number of ways they went about doing this uh, but i also think and this is where we get to some of the crux of the issue is that um some people's fera soul is so strong they cannot keep it in check and they are little more than animals themselves uh, they are given over to their wilder, baser instincts without being able to keep those things in check. Some people are so disconnected from their fera that they can't tap into it or wield it in and of itself at all. These berserkers, I think, were on the side of, of that feral soul being so just wild and so strong that they weren't able to keep any kind of control over it. They weren't able to connect. It just overpowered them. And... Uh, they would cut that loose and let it loose on the battlefield uh, with all the faculties of the re the rest of their soul, all the faculties of their mind, you know, they knew all the motions and the, phys the physicality of warfare, and they became a beast of war. Um, Ulf Ednar fell into a similar uh, vein. I think that warriors over time have utilized the fera in combat for that instinct, that reaction, that quickness, that uh, the, the honed sensory skills, all of these things. I think the fera is used in these kind of things. I think the fera is used by hunters who uh, commune with nature in order to predict patterns of behavior. And the ones that actually can feel the deer coming, the ones that can feel the hogs around the corner, you know, this, there's a connection there, there's a reality. Um, there, there's this, this tangible, visceral feel to it and it creeps up in you and you can feel it in your muscles you can feel its influence in the body and that is the wild it's it's that wild that that, that spark behind the eye that that drive and that beast within um, this is something I know that's going to sound absolutely crazy to individuals out there that don't get it, that uh, that are out of touch with their fera. But there are some of you I know out there, I know some of you from personal experience talking to you guys, I know there are some of you out there uh, who know what I'm talking about. You know about the beast within. And this is what it is. It is your fera soul talking to you. People have... Dis different proportions of soul elements. Some are more intellectual, some are more primal, some are more feral, some are a weird mix that shift back and forth. It all depends on the person. Uh, but it's there, and it's deep inside, and you can't... It never goes away. Um, you can starve it. You can starve the beast. But the beast is always there, and there's always an attachment to the wild, and the wild will never let its roots go. Uh, it has its cause in you, and uh, because you are of the wild, there's a piece of you that is the wild, and this is how it must be. So, I don't talk about mine, and I'm not going to talk about mine on, on, on the air, uh, but I know people who have talked about theirs. And this is something I have conversations with in private. I don't talk about it on the air. You know, it's, not, not, it's too private for that. Um, but again, this is different from your filia, which your filia is your animal companion. There's a separate soul entity that walks alongside you, records your deeds into the well, um, doles out your luck from your family, and ultimately helps to guide you as psychopomp over to... Uh, the ancestors on the other side of the mound. Um, that's a wholly separate being. I'm talking about a piece of your makeup. One of the bricks in your house is of the wild. And being that piece, for some it's a much stronger piece. For some it's a much deeper rooted piece. Uh, for some it's a much smaller piece. But it's still a piece, because we're all animals. Um, it's the gifts of the gods that let us be something else within the realm of Midgar. Uh, but we are Vaitir. We are spirits. And in that, our spirits are made up of Thera as much as they are Odr and Hamr, Mind. The beast within is always a part of us. Everybody's got it. 
Nobody can say who does and doesn't because everybody does. It's all part of the soul. It's all in there. And uh, the wild is never far away. So when you know those people that are given to the wild, uh, that are truly touched by the wild, they have a strong fair soul. If you know those people who are so in tune with animals, they seem to get along with animals better than they do people, uh, they have a strong fair soul. Um, that element is stronger in them than the other elements are. And that is what they are drawn to. That's what they're tied to. You know, I, uh, you know, I've got this whole thing about uh, working in the foster care system because I'm an administrator for an emergency shelter. Uh, that we we work with some therapy pets, and part of the reason that we work with therapy pets as a a tool is because I personally believe, as a heathen, that interacting with the animals speaks to the feral soul of the child. It speaks to that fera, because their mind elements have either been damaged or are emotionally scarred in such a way, to, to such an extent that they pull back and that they do not want to engage. Um, so the more rational, logical elements of things are broken after a fashion and they don't want to engage with other human beings because and there, there's horrors locked in that that they're not ready to deal with. But the fera soul that instinctual side, the fera, the feral, reacts to the animals because they can sense on an instinctual level the, the safety and the peace. So that's why we use that. So the fera soul is extremely important. And that's why I don't just talk about totem animals. I talk about the fera soul because it is that wild, it is that instinct, it is that touch of nature in us that helps us to connect with Midgard around us. It is not just animals, it is plants, it is the dirt, it is the rocks, it is the natural world. It's that piece of the world that burns in our center right alongside the order which is given to us by the gods. So it is a wild, glowing, wonderful thing and when can be harnessed is incredibly powerful but it can also be a madness in and of its own right because the wild is not the way of reason. You know, the gods, the gods are the way of reason and law and and, and rational rationality. Uh, <clears throat> the man-made laws come from the gifts that the gods gave us. The natural law comes from what the gods set into motion, and and that is of the wild. So, and that's the way I see it. You know, ultimately speaking, the wild is a creation of the gods, uh, but it's a different side of things. You know, it's. Uh, we are set aside from that, although we are made from that uh, because of a little tweak that the gods decided to do for mankind that they didn't do for everything else in the world. That's that's our little, you know, we will make these guys in our image just a little bit by doing that. So, but to all of you guys out there that, and this is this may lose me, so this video may seriously lose me some viewers, but uh, it is what it is. You guys wanted the woo-woo stuff. You're getting the woo-woo stuff, so deal with it. Um, to those of you out there who have the beast within, uh, that hear it calling, um, everyone else has it too. They may not hear it. They may not know it's there. Not consciously, anyway. But it is there. Uh, to you guys, you're not crazy. I do see you. I do hear you. And this is why I personally believe things are the way they are. You're not nuts. You're not crazy. Uh, not some werewolf. Although I think werewolves are a physical manifestation of an overpowered, uh, fed a soul in uh, certain kind of situations. I do think it's possible. It's way out there. It's woo woo. But still, you guys are not crazy, all right? You have strong fed a souls. And it is a piece of you. It is right. And there's nothing wrong with it. Yes, it's woo woo as all get out. It's something that nobody's going to talk about on video. Uh, unless they've got the guts to do it, and apparently I do. The, the beast within is a thing. It's something that's true for all of us. It's true for all of you. So don't let anybody quiet that. Don't cage the wild. Learn to work with it. Learn to find a balance between the order of the human world and the wild, because without the wild, uh, we will turn into a husk of what we are. Uh, it takes a balance of all these things, and there's a ferocity in the wild 
uh, that is necessary. Even the gods have it after a fashion. I think that's what they modeled the fair soul after was the wild within them. Um, so anyway, uh, bumping my cable again. This is something that is, you know, a peek into how my mind works and the weird and wily ways that I go. Um, if you guys stuck with this, cool. Thank you. Uh, you guys are awesome. For those that didn't, <laughs> you're not going to see this anyway, so, yeah. But uh, I know I'm going to lose some because it's a little woo-woo. It's a little out there, but you guys wanted it, so you got it. So here, here it is, guys. That's been probably 40 minutes worth of rambling on about the fat of soul, totem animals, the beast within. You're not crazy. It is a part of you. It is natural. It is the way things are supposed to be. You're just a little more sensitive to it than other people are, and that's okay. Uh, learn to harness it, learn to deal with it, learn to make peace with it, because it's you. You're making peace with yourself. You're not making peace with some other beast that's in you. Uh, it, it's really easy to see the beast and think of it as, you know, this other thing, and it's not. That's the thing. It's, you know, I've got a somebody I know who has a wolf, Fera, uh, talks about the wolf as her, and you know, I get it that it feels like it's a separate thing, you know, that they refer to it in the third person, um, the beast within. Uh, but no, the beast within is still you. You are still that beast. And so it's okay to embrace that. It's okay to look at that because honestly, that's how you're going to connect with the Vatier. Honestly, that's how you're going to fuel some of the things you need to do in life. That's where instinct comes from. That's where a lot of our base pattern recognition comes from. Um, embrace your wild. Dance and party and enjoy life. Be one with nature. Uh, embrace your fera. Don't let it take you over. Because <laughs> I do know one guy who's ever on the cusp of his fera taking him off into the wild blue. And we may never see him again. He threatens to go off into the woods uh, with, with nothing but his gun and his spear. And we will never see him again. And I honestly believe that. So, um, mm, you can. <laughs> you can go too feral uh, and never come back. And you end up being sucked away uh, like the fey folk, like the huldra. Uh, you can be sucked into the wild and never find your way back to mankind. Um, that's a thing. So, anyway, it's a long ramble. Uh, it's something that I have thought a great deal on. So I hope that it was helpful or insightful to you guys in some way, shape, form, or fashion. I hope I haven't lost too many viewers off this particular video. If have enough of you stick around, well, we'll see where we go next week. So, thank you guys. Uh, if you enjoyed today's video, please hit like, give a comment, subscribe, and down below. Uh, the more you interact, the more you get. You know how that goes. Um, if you haven't, catch the spiel in another video. All right. Uh, quickly, the contact infos. Uh, you can email me at esherbin at gmail.com. You can follow me on Twitter at e underscore shervin. You can give me anonymous feedback on ericwordweaver.saraha.com. All of those should have appeared here at the bottom in some way, shape, form, or fashion. You can also jump on Facebook and follow me at Word-Weaver Productions. Uh, that is a group that is open. Come in, join the conversation. i uh, love to have you guys. We're getting new people added to the group all the time. There's some networking stuff. I bounce ideas off you guys. You get access to some of my poetry and things like that. So if you're interested in that, please come join. Uh, we very much enjoy it. So Without any further ado, I'm going to let this one go and sign off. So thank you guys again for watching. Y'all are awesome. I really appreciate your support. I never really thought we would have gotten this far in the videos. So uh, I'm enjoying it and trying to figure out where we're going to go uh, for 50 and beyond. So hail to you all. May the gods bless you. May your ancestors smile on you. And thank you.